All right. Is it? It is on. Okay, so we're um, we're here for the last um, talk of the meeting, and also in a way this sort of marks the uh, not the end of the meeting only, but also the the, the end of the Appetiverse network that organized this uh, this meeting, as you know. Um, and at this final, um, well, this last talk, I th uh, we thought it would be a good moment to uh, take a moment and reflect and, and address the um, what, what have we learned question. So this is an easy question to pose, and it's a relevant question to pose. It's not; uh, it's a bit challenging to answer, but I'll give it a shot in uh, in this talk. Um, so this talk will not be about presenting new data. I'm not giving a data talk. I, what I wanted to do is to simply sort of take a step back. Uh, and, and try to put in context what we've seen in this meeting, but also actually what we've done during the last uh, three years of, uh, of Epidiverse. Um, and I, I will uh, start by saying that this is, so the, answering the question, what have we learned is actually not, uh, I didn't find it very easy. And, and, and in a way this is on the, because very uh, much the work that we've been doing in Epidiverse is ongoing. I mean, we're almost coming to the end, but many of the projects are still running, and there's big data sets uh, and important, um, uh, important results that I actually had not seen before coming to this meeting. So I paid very close attention to all the ESRs uh, during the last two and a half days. And I thought, so what happens if we put, um, if we put the results uh, in the line? Um, what do they tell us? Are there patterns emerging? Are there lessons to be learned from the, uh, from the work that we did? Uh, so what I'll do is, I'll, uh, to do that, I will um, uh, first, because not everybody, of course, is from Epidiverse here, I'll, f I'll, I'll take a few moments to go back in time and, and remind ourselves why we started Epidiverse and what was the status of the field when we uh, all started this and why we did Epidiverse in the first place. And then I'll revisit some of the, what I think are the relevant results that have been presented in the, in the past few days by the, the Epidiverse students and see what, uh, what kind of lessons we may draw from them. And I'll, I'll close with a few words on the perspectives as, as I see for, that, that could follow from this. So first, to go back in the time a bit, so, the, um, so Epidiverse, the, I think the core idea, we're interested in, in what is the role of epigenetics in the adaptation uh, and, um, and plasticity of plants in the, in the wild. Uh, so this has been a question that has, been, that has interested, interested us for, well, I would say, a little over a decade now. And in the early years where we worked on this, um, I think there was a bit of a distinction between people who would work on a model system like Arabidopsis and, and people, the ecologists, let's say, who worked on totally different systems and, and were interested in the same question. And they would argue that, well, in my system, because it is clonal, because it has this property, because it is long-lived, um, uh, we think that epigenetics could play maybe a more different or a richer or a different role than just in one species. And so there were a few years, I, would, I think, where the, um, well, the pointer is not working, I think. Where the, um, so we tried to look at DNA methylation in, in non-model species in a, in a rather superficial way. As we know, we started with methylation-sensitive AFLPs. And we would expose patterns that were intriguing in one way, but very, I, would, I think, very unsatisfactory in another way, that you could never go beyond the point of saying, OK, there's this intriguing pattern. It shows some potential, but what does it mean? And we would never be able to answer that question by, by using the same methodology. While at the same time, we fully appreciated the, the incredible power of a model system, not, ju not just because of the tools, but also because you accumulate, lo accumulate uh, knowledge of, of dozens of labs in the world working on one species. So the power of that is unprecedented. So I think when we, when we started um, uh, in the field, there was this big distinction. And at some point, it was absolutely clear to us that we should bridge this gap a bit, at least do our, do our best to bridge this gap. And this, the, the, the seed for this was planted, I think, in 2015, when uh, uh, Lars and Katrin, who have been very important in Epidiverse, but they were even more important in planting the seed of, of Epidiverse in 2015. They organized this workshop, where they, of which the, an IDIF workshop, of which the idea was that we would bring ecologists, molecular biologists, genome biologists, and bioinformaticians together, see how, if, how, what we can do together to advance the field of ecological epigenetics. 
so we spent a couple of days brainstorming. Um, uh, you see many of the many of the faces that were there are now in Epidiverse, although it's not a one-to-one -one match, but there's a lot of overlap between that uh, workshop and what is now Epidiverse. And we spent a lot of days discussing and, and coming up with complex schemes of how we see the world from a ep plant epigenetics perspective. So what are the causes of, of epigenetic diversity? What are the potential consequences? And we spent, I think, a day and a half seeing if we could converge on a joint research program that, we would, uh, where we, that would allow us to work on species that would be broader than just one model species, and that would actually be quite explicitly different from each other because they could be long-lived like a tree or they could be a, a clonal, as I said, instead of, instead of a small annual uh, sexual reproducing model system. And, we would, and so we, we came up with this, so we spent a, a, I think one and a half day discussing this and in the end we converged on the idea that we all committed to. We liked to combine joint forces and, and work on a, a subset of species, just a small number of species, and then have we envisioned clusters of people working on each individual species. So we were thinking about what sort of research program can we develop for an individual species. Then we tried to do that in these uh, three different, in a number of different species. So we ended up with these three species after some going back and forth. And honestly, 2015, the main reason to pick these was that we simply sat down uh, with all of us. We pulled on the screen the list of uh, sequence genome, plant genomes by then. And there was just a handful of species that were not crop species or Arabidopsis. And we, as ecologists, we wanted to work on species that would be broadly present in natural populations in Europe. But of course, we needed reference genomes. So there was a, re a relatively small subset of species that we uh, could, uh, go, could pick. And we simply went for that. And, and the, the main basic idea is that we wanted to do good, solid, uh, high-resolution epigenomic uh, research in natural context in these uh, other species, with a motivating ID that expanding the ID, the, the knowledge that we have on the role of epigenetics in, in, in single model system to a broad set of different species, or a set of different species with different life history and characteristics, would in the end give us a richer understanding of the role that epigenetics could play in plant uh, plasticity and adaptation. So the, the, the common research program that we committed to was actually very straightforward, I would say. I mean, it was the, this was what, what all of us thought made sense, and it was relatively, uh, I think it was uh, not far-fetched, but it was the obvious thing to do, I think. We would take these species and we would characterize natural uh, variation, natural epigenetic variation in, in populations across Europe, uh, understanding its drivers and, and maybe its consequences, and then we, that would be complemented with uh, experiments that, uh, that try to understand in more detail in, in specific experiments the involvement of DNA methylation in uh, stress responses. So, um, we've done that for a couple of years. Uh, time to reflect what, what have, and to, to address the what have we learned question. And I posed this question to the network uh, half a year ago in our last, uh, one of the previous meeting that we had with the network. And, well, the response was sort of like this. Let's say, what have we learned? Well, we've learned a lot. That actually, there was a long list of suggestions and, and um, realizations of what we have learned that was actually not about epigenetics, but it was about how to run a network and, and how to set up a network and how to have collaborations but avoid too many dependencies and all these things. And, and one le lesson was also that the three years is not enough to do an ambition, uh, ambitious uh, project like this. So there was lots of suggestions and lessons learned about collaboration between the three groups or the three types of uh, disciplines were actually quite useful. Scientifically, half a year ago, I think there was very little uh, consensus about what we could learn scientifically. Now, we're half a year later, more results have come in, so we'll, we'll pose the question again and we'll... Um, um, I'll, I'll give my personal reflection on what I think we could, we, we, we can say now we have learned that actually important contributions of the Epidiverse work to the, the field. So one of them, and I think this morning was a great uh, example, a great uh, expression of that, is uh, that we, uh, well, maybe not what we learned, but what we contributed to the field is a lot of uh, useful uh, tools for ecological epigenomics research. Uh, so the network, we generated several uh, reference genomes. Um, 
And on top of that, as, as what was discussed this morning, there was many pipelines generated. And I think it's important to point out that these pipelines, okay, we, we apply them to species for which we have a reference genome, but for the, for the more eco ecological, ecological epigenetics people, I think we, we, we also developed or improved some tools that can now be applied to, uh, to species for which you don't have a reference genome. Clearly, you, you, can, you cannot do the whole ge genome bisulfide sequencing and the DMR calling, which I think is the core of what we did. But there are things that we can do. My Pan Pan mentioned the, the, uh, the, 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 the mobilome sequencing and, uh, improvement, the EpiGBS that we discussed this morning. So there's tools that are hopefully a bit easier to use now for, uh, for, when, you, for, for when you work on species with a reference genome, but also for if you don't have a reference genome. So the, these three pipelines, I think, are the core uh, combined with the SNP pipeline, uh, maybe the core pipelines that the people used in the network. And then there's some others like the small RNA annotation uh, that was made, uh, the, the SNP calling, uh, the identification of the genomic loci that produced these ECC DNA, and uh, Panpan also made a, a tool for generating a meta assembly if you have multiple different assemblies. So lots of tools, resources that are avail available for people there to, uh, out there to use. And I'm not, so I'm going to show later some results also of, of other ESRs. I don't, I, I don't really want to single out individual ESRs because I, I've, I think the ESRs, the PC students in the network did a fantastic job as a, as a team. But I think one person that I do want to single out or that I want to at least uh, highlight here is, is Adam because... Um, <laughs> Actually, the, the half a year ago when we discussed this, what, when we were asking the first, first time the question, so what did we learn? One of the lessons that came out that every network needs an Adam. So Adam has not been only very, very well, intelligent, doing good stuff, but also very helpful. And I think many people relied on his help. So this is, this is one ingredient of having a good network. But then, look, then going to the more, uh, let's say, the, the, the actual biological patterns that we found. What can, what can we say now? So we did so, sort of similar experiments in different species. We learned a lot at the level of the individual species. Did we learn something that goes beyond uh, what, is, uh, what's, what's, what are case studies, let's say? And of course, I think the idea of using multiple species is that you can find similarities and differences between species, and they're both interesting. I think if you, if you analyze a couple of species and you, you find the same sort of patterns gives us a lot of confidence in, in how important or how relevant uh, this, uh, this pattern is. But also, of course, these are completely different species, so the differences from an, an ecologist and evolutionary biologist perspective, the differences are also very interesting. So if one species does this, but another species does that, uh, that could really, that could, I mean, that's what you would predict if these, the mechanisms play different roles depending on the life histories of different species. So I think the idea of doing this potentially gets very rich results. I, I think we, we are mostly exposing patterns and, and really understanding them. We're still quite, quite a step away from that. But let's see what we have. So one thing that I think emerged is that the, the DNA methylation response to stress is very uh, stress-specific and species-specific. And just as, an ex as some examples from the, the projects that were presented here, so in Fragaria and Poplar, um, Similar types of uh, studies, you take, a, you take a plant species, you expose it to a panel, a broad panel of stresses, um, what happens with DNA methylation? So and, and in both cases you see that, okay, uh, there's many stresses, in all stre most stresses something happens, and then there's one or, few, one or two specific stresses that do a lot with the DNA methylation in the genome of that particular species. But it differs between the species, so uh, Fragaria and Poplar, it differs between the species if this is, uh, uh, what stress does this? So in, in Fragaria, it, it's heat that does a lot. In Poplar, it is drought that does a lot, and also a bit heat, but, but different stresses really stand out. And they do not only stand out in terms of which stress does something, but they also stand out in what actually happens. So the, the, the dominant signal in the Fragaria is a, a hypomethylation in response to a, sp a specific stress. And, and in, in popular, it's hypermethylation in response to a different stress. So these are, I don't have answers for this, but these, so the effect that different species do different things, they, they could, as I said, indicate that there's actually different roles uh, for these uh, mechanisms uh, that are relevant for the ecology of this, this species. I mean, you could speculate if, if for, uh, for popular, maybe it's more, the, 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 
the drought stress may be a more relevant stress for that species, whereas for other species like Fragaria, maybe it's different. We don't know, but it's a striking pattern, I think. Not, not only is it stress-specific, species-specific, they're also, they're also, I mean, we see this in all the species, that there's, there's, there almost seem to be like different modes of responses. And so in, in Fragaria, there's one, 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 part, one sort of response is that you have in the stress, a, a specific set of DMRs that respond. So this may, be fun, this may be consistent with the idea that the DNA methylation is involved in, in a, a functional response to a stress. So you have DMRs. They actually showed that there's hotspots of regions in the genomes where, where, the, where DMRs accumulate. So that sort of local response in the, in the genome. Uh, on top of that, we see... Um, let's say, global responses to stresses in most species. And actually, a global response, in a way, it's just the, the, the sum of the, the, local the, the local responses. And you, could see, you can see that, uh, for instance, as Christian point of showed in his popular study, that uh, in response to a specific stress drought, there's a specific transposable element family that changes DNA methylation. And then that causes a broad-scale genomic resp response. So you go from local to almost glo global. And, but that, I think... Even one step further are the data that uh, Morgan showed in the duckweed, where, they, where she found that in response to a specific stress, heat stress, maybe almost every cytosine in the genome responds. So there, there's a, there's a, in, the, in the right panel, we see that there's differential methylation uh, going from 24 to 30 degrees, and it's statistically significant after stringent multiple testing correction for 30% of the cytosine. So in reality, there's... The, the, the number of cytosines, the proportion of cytosines that respond, it's maybe over half or probably over half of the, the genome. So what does that mean? I don't know, but it's an interesting pattern, I think, that emerges. You have these, these local responses in the genome and these global responses, and they, well, people may have an idea of the function, but the, I don't, but it's, the, it's a striking pattern. Then the other lesson thing that clearly emerged, and this is also very consistent, I think, what has been found in other species, it's CHH. If you're interested in uh, DNA, in the, the response of uh, plants, the methylation response to environments, um, most things seem to happen in the CHH context. And I think this is consistent with what we've seen in several studies, the link between the stress response, how this ties in with what happens at transposable elements. So this is, the, uh, this, this is, I think, underlying the, the CHH aspect of the, of the response. And one example, I, I just pulled out one example, but the, the other species that we looked at uh, show pretty much the same. So here the experiment of Christian, where uh, you, he took trees, poplar trees from different origins uh, and exposed them to the same panel of stresses. And then if you, if you do a PCA clustering based on the DNA methylation and you, uh, you do that in the... Uh, in the, for the three different context, contexts, from, from left to right, CG, CHG, and CHH. If you color the dots by the, 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 the mother tree, so the, the origin of the samples, then you get a perfect clustering with uh, CG, if you look at CG methylation. So CG tracks, let's say, the genetics, or at least the genealogy of the, of the, the system. Whereas if you color the same samples by the treatment, uh, you don't see that in CG, but you start seeing that in CHG, and you see it quite clearly in CHH context. So it's CHH that does the, uh, that does the, uh, the trick. Is this completely universal? Ne no. Um, again, an example from the duckweed study. Um, I think we have, we have high power in this experiment. This was uh, 16 replicates per groups. There was, this, this is the experiment where we found so many differentially methylated uh, cytosines in the genome in CH, CHG context. There was appreciable levels of uh, CHH uh, methylation in the genome, but it simply doesn't respond, uh, at least not that we, that we can detect it. So we don't think it's there. So not universal, it's universal for the three epigvs core species that we use, but then if you expand a bit further, it's not always the, the environmental response, not always in CHH. Then another lesson, maybe something that was clearly predicted, but, but not very well shown until now, I think, is that transgenerational epigenetic, epigenetic inheritance is real in under asexual reproduction. So this has been the idea of the transgenerational stability of environment-induced epigenetic marks has been a, a big question in the field for more than a decade. And, and 
it has been clearly shown that under sexual reproduction, based on work mainly in Arabidopsis, but also other sexually reproducing species, it is, it's a cute idea, but it is simply not there too much, or hardly there. But we think, um, knowing what, how uh, uh, methylation resetting, how that happens in germlines, uh, I mean, it's very obvious that you could, if you, if you, if you reproduce without germlines, you're much more in a position to uh, propagate epigenetic marks that you acquired. And we see that in the two clonal species that, we, um, that were studied in Epidiverse, so the, the Fragaria, um, if you stress them and then continue to grow them for, clonally for three clonal generations, then the, the, the stress-induced DMRs in the first generation, after you take away the stress, some of them persist. I mean, they go down, of course, and after a few generations, they're gone. Uh, but at least a few generations, they persist. And that this was actually accompanied by uh, also inheritance of gene expression, induced gene expression states over these three generations. I mean, also they're going down rapidly and gone after three. But still, for a couple of generations, this sticks for a, a number of uh, genes. Uh, also, in the, the, the other clonal system, the duckweed system, uh, as Morgan has shown, um, exposing these plants for, uh, for a number of generations, quite a number of generations, to st different environments, and then evaluate, and then putting them back in a common environment, and then after, uh, no, let's say, 10 generations, evaluating uh, their methylomes. And you can see clearly that the methylome in these plants, they are reflective of the, the, the environment that they're in currently, but also the environment that they were in 10 generations ago. So, uh, transgenerational epigenetic inheritance in clonal plants is, is, is real, uh, maybe not unexpected, but relevant because there's so many clonal plants in the world and there's so many commercial uh, clonal propagation going on in the, in the world in, in, in agriculture. So the relevance of this for propagating um, functional states, I mean, we, we saw in the Fragaria example, it's a bit unclear, we saw in the Fragaria example that gene expression does, to some extent, uh, inherits. But we also see that the, the, the DNA methylation variance in the context that we know is most responsive now, CHH, actually does not inherit well. So it's a bit unclear, I mean, there's some gene expression inheritance, it may not be tied to CHH methylation because that apparently is so transient that it doesn't uh, inherit well, even, even in clonal species. So what is the link between the, the, the inherited gene expression and, and the DNA methylation that is inherited is quite unclear still, I would say. So that's, that's I think, some of the generalities that, and differences that emerged from doing the, what we called the stress experiments in, in Epidiverse. Of course, there was also a big cluster of, uh, of experiments that was about uh, describing natural uh, DNA methylation variation across populations in, in Europe. So you, we've, seen, we've seen the talk, so we had Poplar Fragaria Tlaspi, in, in all cases samples collected from all over Europe, then brought to a common environment and then screened for DNA methylation variation. And so, this is, so these are, as I said, this is, I think, when I, when I came here a couple of days ago, I had no idea what came out of these projects, pretty much. But looking at the different talks, there's, I think there's some interesting patterns. And, but first, uh, maybe it's good to point out the, so the role that genetics, genetic variation plays in these three studies is quite different. So the, uh, in the, the Fragaria example, there's genetic and there's epigenetic variation and there's there's, there's not really a way to control uh, for them in this study. Uh, the popular system tried to exclude uh, the role of genetic variation by looking at the clone that was planted uh, across Europe. And in uh, the TLASPI study, the, the, a different approach was chosen. It's a system, of course, with a lot of genetic and epigenetic variation co-occurring together, but to unravel them, this was, the this was a system where they used uh, dense SNP genotyping as well, so they could statistically unravel uh, the effects of, the, of genetics and epigenetics, or look at what part of the, the epigenetics is actually associated with underlying genetics. So, if I, so I, look, I listened to these three talks and I uh, did a very crude uh, summary of what I think the, came out of that, or part of what came out of that. So in all these cases, as I said, these plants were sampled in the field and then either seeds or cuttings were brought to the, the common environment and then in that common environment after a while the DNA methylation was screened. 
And then, so, so what happened? So, for instance, in, what did they find in, in Poplar? Um, so, in, no, let me say, so in, in all cases, the interest was, of course, to see what part of the DNA methylation variation that you see is actually associated with the climate of origin or the environment of origin. Because if you find that association, that is what you would predict if the, if the, the DNA methylation has some adaptive or functional relevance. So in the Poplar system, uh, it was found that global uh, CHH methylation correlates with climate when you bring these plants to the, the common environment. Uh, in TLASPI, it was also found that global, global methylation levels correlate with climate. And also in Fragaria, gene body methylation in CG context correlates with climate. So we picked three species. In all these cases, there is, even when you bring these plants from the field to a common environment, there are detectable associations between patterns in the methylome and the environment uh, where they came from. So this is at least consistent with the idea that, that DNA methylation is involved somehow in the process of adaptation in these, or local adaptation in these systems. Um, of course, a big question is, do you, do you find these patterns, these associations, because they, as they found in Arabidopsis, because these patterns reflect or are downstream consequences for genetic, uh, of, of genetic uh, differences between the samples that are locally selected and then express um, uh, or cause the methylation differences. Um, in, um, so in, if, if I compare the Poplar and the Tlaspi system, so in the Poplar system, we hoped to rule that out by using a clone, and we still find this correlation. Um, What's interesting there is that the, um, that the, the CHH context that is so, uh, so responsive to environments that we could predict to maybe be involved then in the, in the, the environmental gradients, uh, th that actually was not stable enough to, uh, to transmit to, the, to, be, to be expressed in the, in the common environment. So DMRs and CHH contexts that were found in natural field populations, when you actually measure in the fields, there were a lot there, but they're actually gone when you go to the, the, the uh, bring the plants in a common environment. But there were DMRs, uh, quite a lot of DMRs that were present in the fields that, was, that persisted stably in the, uh, in the common garden in the, different, in the other contexts, like CG and CHG. But the CHH methylation that we think is um, important for environmental responses apparently did not uh, inherit was not stable enough to be expressed uh, in the common environment, whereas we would have predicted that maybe in a clonal system. I found it interesting that Dario presented in his TLASPI system, where, which is a sexual uh, system, where I would have predicted, okay, there any link between CHH in a common environment and the, and the, the, the ecological environment in the field would be gone, but because that for sure does not inherit in TLASPI. I think actually, if I understand the, the results uh, well, there was actually quite some evidence that even in a common environment, there was a lot of DMR variants in the material that could not be traced to any SNP in the genome, so that, that there was no evidence of genetic uh, determination of those uh, variants, but that could actually be traced back to the climate of the origin of these populations. So it, this is a bit of a funny, an interesting result, I think. So I would have predicted to find that in the popular, in the clonal system, not in TLASPI, but you seem to find more evidence for that, for the, let's say, the stability from the field to the garden um, uh, in TLASPI, of, of the stability of CHH variants. And also in Fragaria, so the, if you bring the plants to the, from the field to the, uh, to the common environment, also in the common environment, actually in all sequence contexts, uh, CG, uh, CHG and CHH, you see the you, re you retain the, the methylation differences that were present in the field. You also see them in the common garden. So, but I think in that system, it's quite more difficult to unravel what, what part of that could actually be stably, stably transmitted versus genetically controlled uh, DNA methylation variation. So pr some preliminary, I would say, um, uh, uh, Conclusions from, from these natural population studies is that there is a correlation with climatic variation and DNA methylation in all species, consistent with the idea that this could be relevant for, uh, for adapt local adaptation. And there's, uh, there's limited but, and mixed evidence for stable memory of environmental effects in some of these systems, but clearly not in all. 
So another thing that's um, by looking at these three different species and, and doing all these samples um, in the, from the, that came from the natural population study, another thing that's realized that we can of course do, and this is actually pointed out by the, the ESRs who did these, uh, the, the PhD students who did these studies, is that of course you can expose clear differences not in the environmental response uh, to, of DNA methylation, but also the, simply the DNA methylation landscape, so irrespective of an environmental response. And there's interesting patterns also here emerging that we don't, uh, do not have a good explanation for, but are very clear. So, for instance, if you look at the gene body methylation in the three species, uh, and then you, you categorize all, you plot all the genes for, what, for their level of uh, DNA methylation variation in the three contexts, so left panel Fragaria, then Tlaspi, then Poplar, and each species, the three uh, the gene body methylation is expressed for the, is, is, is given for the three uh, different sequence contexts. Then typically you see bimodal, uh, bimodal distributions, so there's many genes that have uh, no methylation, and then there's a subset of genes that have high methylation in that particular context. And the, so I, the point that does not work, but for instance here in, 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 uh, in CG, CA, CHG and CHH, there's many genes that, have, uh, that are almost not methylated, and there's peaks of the genes that show high methylation. And what's funny to see is that this is very, the, the pattern that you see is, the, is very different between the species. So, the, so Poplar and Fragaria are quite uh, similar, but Tlaspi stands out in, the, in that there's actually very few genes that have high gene body methylation in CHD context. But there is a second peak, but it's at a much lower level. So these are, I mean, by looking at different species, of course, you can, doing the same studies, you can expose these patterns. And then, again, we're exposing the patterns and, un and understanding what's causing them is a different thing. But at least this is, uh, these are things that we can, uh, we can uh, reveal now. So these were some, I would say, some generalities by, from, uh, from comparing the, the, the studies in the program that's, that did similar uh, research in different species. Um, I will use this, uh, this uh, figure to also point at some of the other uh, results or approaches that I think are interesting to, uh, that come from Epidiverse. So, the, the students will recognize this, uh, this, this uh, uh, scheme. This is how we as ecological epigeneticists uh, think uh, or visualize that, the, that epigenetic variation could be relevant for adaptation and plasticity. Uh, and, and then, so, so it's about the sources of, of epigenetic variation and then the consequences. So environmental induction, spontaneous epimutation and genetic control. I think we've, the studies that we just talked about have very much emphasized uh, either environmental induction or genetic control of, uh, of either heritable or non-heritable epigenetic variation. But I think some other arrows in this scheme have been addressed uh, in an interesting way in, in Epidiverse as well. So for instance, uh, one of our projects in Italy by, by Paloma, she, she realized that um, working on having data of many, many, many individuals that come from the same clonal genotype uh, poplar genotype. It, it gives a very nice tool to, uh, for instance, track very infrequent events. So the characterization of where epimutations, what are epimutations, what are their associations uh, in gene bodies is what she's done. Uh, really made good use of the fact that we, we used in this clonal system with many, with data from many replicated individuals to track these infrequent events. And then another thing um, to point out, so the environmental response itself can be, is under genetic control and this can differ between genotypes and this was actually shown uh, in the work here in, the, in Seville uh, by Troy e, that's show, showing that the, uh, the effect of an environmental induction on the epigenome, herbivory, is actually very different between different genotypes of the, of the plant that you use. So I think this is, this is a nice arrow in this, di in this, uh, this figure where there's genetic control uh, of the environmental induction on the epigenetic variation. So, this is, uh, these are some patterns, I think, that I wanted to highlight from, the, uh, from the, the epigenetic research. So, thinking back now, so was this, uh, how, how much has this helped us? Huh? So, we, we argued, let's look at different species, not just one species, let's embrace good epigenomic research in different species. We join these different groups. Um, uh, what, what, has, what has that brought us? So I, th I think, th th was this a good thing to do? Was this relevant? This is give us good results and good progress in the field? I think absolutely yes. 
I think the things that I just mentioned are really relevant contributions and bring the field of uh, understanding the role of epigenetics, DNA methylation in, in plant uh, adaptation and, and plant plasticity uh, quite a big step further. At the same time, I think we, um, uh, we need to be a bit uh, realistic. Yeah, and um, I think we all understand the, the, also the limitations of what we, what we have done. So, uh, one of the so I think thinking back five or six years ago, I think we were so heavily criticized of using low resolution methods to study DNA methylation that we focused very much on studying DNA methylation at a high resolution level. But of course we do that now, and of course it's obvious we expose patterns, but it's still a huge gap from exposing these patterns to really understanding the role that these mechanisms play in adaptation. So we took an important step, but we're, I think there's many steps to take. And the big, I think, big obvious gaps uh, to, uh, to explore or to, to take on next uh, are uh, both actually, on, I think, on the, on the more molecular genomic side, but also, at, but also on the ecological side. So at the, at the more molecular mechanistic side, it's this to me. Uh, we, generating all the DNA methylation data and, and just a actually having rather limited uh, gene expression data um, is, um, um, is bringing us one step further, but the next bottleneck is clearly there. So this, this is completely obvious. So what, what, does, what do these methylation uh, changes that we see and that we document, what do they actually mean? And step one, of course, is to do a gene expression, maybe to gene expression in, in time series, as some people are doing uh, here and still in the network. Um, that gives us at least a better description of the a be, a be better insight in what uh, could be uh, well, what are at least the functional associates of the methylation variation if they map to the same locus. If we can understand either in cis or in trans how methylation is associated with uh, with uh, the gene expression, because as we know, it can go both ways. Maybe we started this ten years ago thinking that DNA methylation controls gene expression, but we know now. Uh, the, the, the relation is not so simple, so unraveling that clearly needs to be done by simply observational studies with RNA-seq, I would say, but also with all the, I mean, we don't do it now, but maybe in a few years, also the ecologists that work on these systems can uh, use, make advantage of the tools that are out there now to edit the, the, the epigenome. So, the, so having actual experimental control of DNA methylation at a specific site that you think that's interesting and then evaluating its function, I think, would take us a big step further. So I think there's many more things to do at the molecular and mechanistic level, but this clearly to me is, uh, is the, uh, the, the obvious thing that is, uh, that is the current bottleneck. At the same time, I think there's also steps to be, that we can take from, um, at the, from the ecological side of things. So I think the ecology that we brought to Epidiverse was rather rudimentary, I would say. We simply took different species and we tried to relate um, patterns in DNA methylation to very crude environmental correlates uh, of the environment. And the approach is good, but I think we can take, we can take steps there too. And just as an example, this is, um, this is uh, from a recent paper by uh, Colicio and Herman, um, where they, they used uh, climatic data to to characterize temporal autocorrelation in climates um, across the map. So if it's rainy and warm in year one, is it also rainy or warm in year two? And, and, and the, uh, the, how should I say this? Um, a continent at the continental or ge at any geographic scale, there's variation in this. So some sites are more variable from week to week or month to month or year to year and others are not. And if you think about what is the relevance of epigenetic variation, or what is more generally, what is the relevance of plastic responses, then this sort of environmental information gives you a very good predictions of in what populations you might expect transgenerational plasticity, or just within generation plasticity, or no plasticity at all, but fixed, uh, fixed genotypes. So, I mean, we're also here, we're on the right track, but we could take uh, uh, steps, I would say, to, uh, to bring more realism, ecological realism, to the sort of analysis that we do. And then to, um, uh, to wrap up, so I, th I think the, um, so I, to conclude, I think we, we, we made 
uh, good and important steps that were good for the field of ecological epigenetics. And the, the, there's clear, clearly next steps to take. And I think one of the, one of the main legacies that, uh, that the network will have, at least for the people who are involved, is that we, I mean, we are, it's, it's fully clear, we cannot understand the meaning of, uh, of a phenomenon like epigenetics if you don't understand the mechanism. So I think for many of us, the days of, of not trying to look at the mechanisms in detail when you want to say something about the ecological and the evolutionary role, um, I think these days are, are we leaving gradually behind us. And I think making this transition for us as ecological PIs was quite challenging. Uh, is quite challenging, but I think one of the one of the main uh, legacies of the network is that we th I think uh, that uh, the people the the PhD students that were that we sort of raised in this network will find this much more easy because they've been collaborating so much uh, across these different disciplines. And uh, last words, uh, I said it, I said it yesterday to the students. I think uh, having seen all of you presenting here in the in, in these two days, I think it's uh, I think you really showed that you. Uh, you can do this, and you, you were, I was very impressed with, uh, with what you did, how you did this. With that, I'll uh, leave it. That's what I wanted to say. And so I thank you for your attention. Did you want? Thank you. No? You did very clear... So well, there was no, <laughs> no new data, so there's no new questions. <laughs> okay. So. Thanks, Kuhn. Um, that was really a great summary. And I know we talked about this before, but I think it would also be nice to put some of these general uh, uh, experiences and, and conclusions, uh, write it down somewhere and, and publish this somewhere. <laughs> like at the, at the more superficial level, but in term, you know, these lessons learned stuff. No, I that agree. That would I be very nice. I, I think it was difficult, difficult until recently because so many of the results were not out there, but we're now in a different position to do that. I think so too. So that was really a nice summary, Kuhn. Um, I mean, I come not from the Epidiverse Network, and I was, um, I think, really impressed. But I was thinking about uh, the next steps you're thinking of. Um, so for me, I think I completely agree with um, those two points you raised, especially with the functional relevance. But I was also wondering what do you think about the evolutionary relevance? I think that was basically completely lacking in this Epidiverse Network. What do I think about that? So the, um, so the evolutionary relevance is clear, but of course there's many ways in which also even any plasticity that is even, that by any other mechanism uh, than epigenetics has, bears relevance uh, on the course of uh, evolution. And so there's clear links between... Um, so I think when people, when people discussed initially the, the relevance of, of epigenetics for evolution, I think the most extreme variant that you could think of is the thing that people focused on or that people thought of, which is, okay, if there's really stable epi alleles that are stable for tens or dozens or hundreds of generations and you can get a selection, uh, you, you can not only get selection on the phenotypes that they cause, but you can actually get a, a response to selection in, t in the sense of adaptation that could in principle be, 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 be based solely on DNA methylation variation and not on any sequence variation. And in principle, that, would, uh, that is clearly possible if you find, if there are systems where these autonomous uh, methylation variants live long enough to affect, uh, to really affect uh, the, uh, the selection, the response to selection. So in, the, in, in many of, the, cell, in the, of the, 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 the species that we looked at and that other people have looked at, I mean, there's very little, there's not too much evidence for such long-lived uh, epi alleles. But I, I completely agree the system that you take on, which, which I like a lot too, so the, 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 the duckweeds. So these clonal systems, they're, they're the ball game could be a bit different. I think the jury is still out. We don't know yet how, how much of the, how many really long-term stable um, 
methylation variants are there that are affecting gene expression and that are autonomous. But at least the potential is there, I would say. And, um, and then maybe it, it depends on the... They will also not live forever, but it depends, I think, on, on, the, on the balance between how long they live versus how, what, is the, what is the rate of fluctuation in the environments. That, that, I think, will determine the relevance of it. But I think this is only... So th there's, there's a, a, those sort of systems, I think, it will be very relevant to, to explore it and to see. Um, um, but of course, that's, I mean, this is the most extreme case that we can, one could think of and if you think about what is the role of DNA methylation in evolution. I think there's, there's, much more, there's other roles that are much more well established and super interesting that I think uh, uh, could, be, uh, could be explored. Like, I mean, the obvious one is the, the, the role that DNA methylation has on, chain, on genetic changes in the genome, either via uh, transposition or uh, deamination of the, of, the, of the genome. So I think there's a lot of there's a lot of relevance there of the evolutionary relevance of, of DNA methylation mechanisms to modify the uh, the genome that is then evolving. So the, uh, that makes me think of another example that I think is where it, it also relevant for uh, for evolution. I mean, it actually, it's relevant for evolution, but also for ecology. So there's systems. I think in, in, in trees, this was shown that I think it was sex determination, but I I forgot the details that. If you, if you look at different species within, the, within a genus, some species have a, a, a hard-coded uh, phenotype, uh, let's say sex determinism, um, that is completely hard-coded, genetically determined, whereas another species, a, a related species has the same pathway, but there's an epigenetic flexibility built in, so that depending maybe on the environment, this, the system could... There, there's some evolutionary flexibility, let's say, to be... To be more plastic or less plastic in the in the expression of such a trait, and I think that's also so that that would that would make total sense uh, for, for not just for this trait but for other traits. And I think there's a lot there's an interesting to look at it from that perspective. So which traits, when are is a trait hard coded? When is a trait with the same uh, underlying uh, genetic networks has built in evolution uh, built in plasticity uh, through epigenetics? Uh, I think that's an interesting avenue to explore too.